Saturday, October 26, 1991, two weeks prior to the presentation of the Genesis 10 material in Irvine, California, scheduled for November the 9th, I've already done a tape in connection with uh, reading the text of the primary lecture for that uh, presentation, but I thought I'd make another tape attached to another item that I'll hand out first. It's a list of 18 presuppositions that enter into the set of convictions I have about the origin of the nations from the family of Noah after the flood. What I'd like to do on the tape that I don't do in the reading, or that is in the handout itself that I'll read, is to explain these presuppositions, to support them to some extent, to explain the rationale, the logic that goes into these presuppositions so as not to just present them uncritically. The first presupposition listed under the boldface heading chronology <clears throat> And these presuppositions are stated in almost in recipe form, that is, in the imperative mood of the verb. Take the chronological suggestions of Genesis 5 and 11 at face value. There are no chronological gaps. That would mean, for example, in Genesis 11, verse 16, Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. This section of the tape was clumsily worded two weeks ago. Obviously, what I'm referring to is the fact that you take each one of those chronological notices, the, uh, birth, the age of Eber at the time Peleg was born, the age of Sheila when Eber was born, the age of Arphaxad I when Sheila was born, and so forth. You sum them up, and you get an estimate for the uh, time elapsed from the flood down to the birth of Abraham of some 350 years, three and a half centuries. And uh, that's coincident with the stated death date of Noah, because Noah dies for 350 years later. And I believe there's a relationship there, that in a sense, uh, God selected Abraham out of this sense of order that he has, uh, simply because he was born two years after Noah died. But uh, be that as it may, it's the no-gap approach to Genesis 11, and for that matter, Genesis 5. Alternative view is, that the world chronology that results from summing up these passages, Genesis 11, Genesis 5, are far too small. There's far too little time to accommodate what secular scholarship and science and observed data tells us about world chronology. As a consequence, we should read the text in a different way, or at least we should interpret it in a different way. So that, for example, Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg really means, or might mean, Eber lived for 34 years and begot the ancestor of Peleg, so that you could have an interval of some three centuries or more between Eber and Peleg. Uh, that is to take a liberty. One would never suspect that from the text, but under the pressure of a chronological model that seems to contradict the Bible, in order to defend the reputation of the Bible as being sound and acceptable and tenable, one defends it in effect by exercising a liberty and interpreting it, and in effect bows to the pressure of the high chronological schemes that are built into the modern perception of things. Now, why do I do otherwise? Why do I adhere to the appearance, in this case, the obvious reading of these relatively short intervals, only 350 years between the flood and the birth of Abraham? Well, one basic reason, I won't give all the reasons because I want to cover all 18 points if I can on this tape, but one basic reason that I'm unimpressed by these high chronological models that have been constructed, they've been constructed for different reasons from different sciences. Geology has its reason for believing in high chronology. Uh, I guess stellar evolution has its reason. Uh, physics has its reason. There are various converging reasons for these high chronological scale models for world chronology, I'm unimpressed with them because I'm aware of the implications of high and low chronology for picturing the power of God, and I regard God as the author of the times and seasons. Uh, God is the author of history. And I hold very suspect any tendency to invoke large quantities of time because of what this does to our image of God. In other words, I can explain to myself why modern man, modern apostate man, non-believing man, those who do not have the Christian faith, have a vested interest. The modern non-believer has a very visceral, uh, vested interest, 
something deep down in his psyche, a vested interest in expanding chronology, not just to undermine the authority of Scripture, but to undermine a certain frightening conception of God that he's unable to deal with, and that is that he's, we live in a universe governed by a God of power. Power in physics means the ability to do work inversely proportional to time. So when you have short intervals of time, the same work is done that might have been done in a much longer time, you have accordingly much more power. So you're talking about the concept of power. The Bible presents the concept of power. It talks about godly people as having power. And it talks about God as having power. And the seven-day creation is sort of reduced to a mockery on the basis that it sort of trivializes God. It does exactly the reverse. The shorter the amount of time required for God to create the physical universe, the more powerful he is according to our basic con concept of physics. So power means, you know, the lightning bolt. It means the ability to accomplish a great deal in a very short span of time. And of course, we're given a balanced view of this by the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter, where he says that a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. That first proposition that a thousand years is as a day uh, shows his eternality, his ability to stand back from time and see everything in an instant. But the other statement, a day is as a thousand years, is a statement about his power, that he can accomplish a thousand years worth of work if he wishes in a single day. That, that then would be the power doctrine. So power is part of it, and then eternality, eternal perspective is the other. And I am very suspicious uh, toward people, uh, many of them conservatives, in other respects, who seem to shun power and they express their this feeling of discomfort, this lack of ease in dealing with power in the name of democracy. I'm very suspicious of what democracy has done to the conscience and the imagination of modern man. Very suspicious. Because it's an alternative way to view reality and it's very easy to stand back from the democratic enterprise and simply say, well, look at what, what is happening to the ability of modern man to conceptualize reality from all sides. He seems to shun power, and that shunning of power in anything related to world chronology and anything related to origins, he prefers evolution to revolution, and to prefer on principle, to prefer uh, revolution, pr to prefer evolution to revolution, is to shun power by on the face of it, to shun the ability of God to do a thousand years worth of work in one day, and as a believer in the what is stated about the rapture and the sudden instantaneous transformation of the human body in an atom of time or no time at all. Uh, that all commends to me the concept of a God of power. Yes, a God of patience and a God of an eternal perspective so that he can stand back and look at a thousand years and regard it as a single day, but also a God fully capable of doing a thousand years worth of work in one day, the doctrine of power. Therefore, generally speaking, when I consider chronological issues, and the Bible, on the face of it, suggests these comparatively brief intervals of time from the flood to the birth of Abraham, for example, I opt for that, all other things being equal, because that commends itself to someone who has no democratic bias against um, concentrated power, concentrated power on the part of the human despot, the ruler, concentrated power on the part of God. I have no bias against that, no prejudice against power, and therefore, having no such prejudice, I see no reason to uh, introduce something into the text. Now, I wouldn't, however, say that this is just because I'm more consistently literalistic, because the concept of literalism is a problematic concept. All language is symbolic. And as a matter of fact, in interpreting Genesis 10 and 11, I invoke a non-literalism of my own. I regard the word son as not necessarily mean, meaning begotten son. Now, I have usage to support me. Obviously, you refer to the sons of Israel, and it doesn't mean immediate sons. The 12 tribes of Israel are established by immediate sons of Jacob, but there are many others who are called sons of Israel collectively, and it really means descendants of, of Israel or descendants of Jacob. And I invoke that in interpreting the men, um, the, the, excuse me, the sons who are named in Genesis 10 some of whom are begotten sons and some are not. And I mentioned that on the other tape. But the general attitude toward time and power conditions the way I take the chronologies of Genesis 5 and 11 at face value, point number one. Point number two, designed ethnology. Again, the imperative mood. Regard racial and linguistic distinct distinctions as designed rather 
than casual. Basically, you have to make a decision when it comes to racial characters. And just on general policy, I opt for design rather than casualness. Uh, I do this because race uh, appears to me not only to be, uh, the, the races are interestingly contrastive, white versus black, tall versus short, uh, high cheekbones or facial convexity versus uh, low cheekbones or facial concavity, a number of other traits uh, that are very interesting, but those traits are geographically, they form a geographic pattern. Blacks and yellows are oriented to the continuum of the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, and the uh, Indian Ocean. And of course, and, and whites, and what I would call the, the aquiline strain, or the reds, are oriented to the upper sea, the Mediterranean, and the continuum of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a symmetry there. It's a symmetry that exists in Sumerian tradition, where the Sumerians referred to the, simply to the lower sea and the upper sea, the lower sea being the Persian Gulf, the upper sea being the Mediterranean. And with an eye to symmetry and design, and with a suspicion against Francis Bacon and the Baconians, that is the empiricists of the modern world, I suspect, I hold suspect not only the modern uh, discomfort with power, but the modern discomfort with form and pattern, which you, which you can see in uh, Francis Bacon in The Advancement of Learning, where he makes a comment about the stars and says, well, that proves or demonstrates that, that God really is in favor of irregularity rather than the kind of symmetry that we humans would feign. That's a, that's a bias on his part, and I hold that bias suspect that as I worship of God of symmetry and order as well as power, and the fact that we live in various states of chaos and disorder, lack of symmetry, and that certain phenomena in nature are non-symmetrical and rather disorderly, does not mean that we do not in fact have a God of symmetry and order, doing things decently and in order. And with that commitment, I simply, I simply observe design. It's not just that you have the polarity of black and white in general, but you have a polarity drawn up along geographic lines, and that commends itself to me as evidence of an underlying design to create ethnic groups and to do so in a systematic way. And generally speaking, the races come from Adam and the linguistic stocks come from Noah. And uh, there's a very definite pattern of, of design in, in both. So I opt for the concept of designed ethnology rather than casual ethnology. The third point, design theocracy. Treat the various Old Testament names of God as vestiges of an unstated pre-Abrahamic theocratic system, cognate with the high pantheon of the Sumerians. Well, I won't go into the details of this, except to say that the Old Testament uh, offers us a series of, a series of names of God and they're distinct. That is, Abraham has to do with El Shaddai. Uh, Shem has to do with Yahweh Elohim. Cain is identified with the name Yahweh alone, without Elohim. Um, Melchizedek is associated with El Elyon. These names are recurrent. With an eye toward universal design, being a believer in design, I draw the assumption and test the assumption that these names were once part of a perspicuous system that there was some sort of balanced meaning among these different names. The other view is the classic evolutionary view, simply that a group over here sort of evolved a reference to God in some cultural community to sort of develop the preference for calling God El Shaddai. Another group over here evolved or developed casually the preference for calling God El Elyon, and I don't believe in that sort of casualness. On the contrary, I think there's a systematic reason why Abraham deals with God as El Shaddai. It has to do with the fact that Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees and then moved to Haran. Both of them are lunar cult centers. And so my assumption, my belief is, that there's a correlation between the name El Shaddai and the lunar principle, as I call it, uh, meaning that these symbols, the solar principle, the lunar principle, the storm principle, and so forth, correlate with the names of God intrinsically because I believe in an, an intrinsically ordered symbolic universe. In other words, the sun represents what I would call a dispensational dimension of God. The, lo the moon, another dimension. The lunar principle has to do with mortality and with Abraham's passing a religious heritage onto his children. Whereas when you come to the Christian apostles, they are predominantly celibate. They're looking to a resurrection state that has no, uh, has no genetic continuity in it, no sexuality as we know it. And so the, the sun is to the moon what immortal man is to mortal man. And it, there's, there's more than that. But it's a, it's a systematic pattern. And I see evidence for that in the distribution of names 
in the early post-Diluvian world. The fourth principle, aristocracy. I've already mentioned the fact that I'm very suspicious of the intellectual and spiritual limitations of democracy because democracy is only one phase of world history. It doesn't necessarily mean a culmination. It doesn't necessarily mean what man was always intended for. It's just a stage. Aristocracy, of course, means the rule of the best, and I see something profoundly aristocratic in the account of the na origin of the nations. The statement, recognize the international and aristocratic character of Noah's family as pre-existing the nations whom they created. Purge one's thinking of democracy. You see, it's very simple. Uh, Noah's family are not a people. They are not the people. They're a body of elite rulers with no one to rule over as yet. In other words, in the case of a monogenetic origin, especially of that kind, where a group are selected to form a set of families, to go into the ark and to survive the flood and then to rebuild the nations, you have got, uh, you have got a set of rulers who pre-exist their populaces. And therefore, you've got a pyramidal. When you have a monogenetic origin, you have a pyramid being, being built. The nations are being built from the top down rather than from the bottom up. Therefore, the whole idea of a monogenetic origin, especially in that kind of context, the Diluvian context, is radically non-democratic. Because the democratic theory is the consent of the governed. You have peoples, populaces, and then they decide who will govern them. Well, here you have governors, rulers, without a people, kings pre-existing their nations, the nations they govern. And that becomes a great uh, sanction for monarchy the concept that you have a ruling class before you even have an underclass. So it has to do with the monogenetic principle and the monogenetic principle operative in a situation where the populace, the common people, have been decimated, wiped out. The statement in Genesis 6 is, the end of all flesh has come up before me. And that phrase, all flesh, is redolent of democratic notions of the common man. And it, essentially, the common man became extinct in the flood and we go over from water to fire in terms of judgment and Sodom and Gomorrah post diluvian phenomenon are judged by fire out of heaven meaning that the the water rat theory of man is gone the level common average person is gone in the flood and replaced with a set of elite aristocrats who had sin natures but when they sin it's very different they're sinning as a kind of angelic powers and the appropriate means of punishing them is fire rather than water so a very clear-cut anti-democratic implications to the entire story of the flood. And that, again, is why the doctrine of the universal deluge is unpalatable to the modern thinker, because they've adapted their spiritual lives to democracy in such a way as to lose contact with this aristocratic conception of things, the complete annihilation of the average man, Genesis 6, the end of all flesh, and the survival of an elite company of people designated for the purpose of regenerating the human race in a Gentile way, that is, creating nations and creating nations that operate a divine power of rulership, rulership uh, Romans 13.1. So the whole account of the flood is profoundly undemocratic in character. And again, there's abundant evidence that evangelical sentimentalists reasoning presuppositionally from democracy, which was at high tide in the 19th century, the Victorian age, have read democracy, democratic conceptions, into the, their picture of the family of Noah in a completely inappropriate way, treating this sect of eight rulers, really, and they're not just four couples, they're eight rulers, treating them like a Fred Fledstones, that is, treating them as though they're a fraction of a larger world of common, ordinary people who just happen to survive. The fifth point, designed chronology. Recognize the 30-year generation of Genesis 11 as a principle of political design on the part of Noah's universal family. I'm simply saying that that generation rhythm, there's a scientist, scientifically minded empiricist, who wrote an article suggesting that because of the regular rhythm of 30-year intervals, we're not, to take this as unscientific, this is not natural. And therefore, they assume that the text is not inspired because it's not representing things as they are, but the author is imposing a an artificial rhythm of 30 years on these uh, generations. Well, where do artificial rhythms come from? They come from either God or from man. In this case, they come from both. They don't come from the author. They come from Noah's family. They were nation builders. They were doing everything decently and in order. So they had a 30-year uh, rhythm, a 30-year interval in their minds comparable to our four-year terms for our presidents. You see, there's plenty of evidence for symmetrical designing, jubilee years, and all sorts of rhythmic 
chronological structures in the ancient world. Why would anyone ex uh, uh, suspect that uh, the, 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 the rhythm of Genesis uh, 11 would be any different? So again, an eye at the design, contrary to the empirical, earthy, modern, democratic, Baconian, uh, natural scientific bias toward the irregular and the random. Multiple identities account for multiple careers, and there is some evidence of multiple careers, account for multiple careers and multiple names among the Noahic patriarchs. Of course, we have one example, Jacob and, uh, Jacob and Israel. We have another one, Abram, Abraham. But account for multiple careers, multiple names, by dividing the 30-year generations, which are a political unit, 30 years, into such post-Diluvian lifetimes as Shem's 500 years. The text says actually that Shem lived for 502 years after the flood, 500 years after the birth of our fox and two years after the flood, and divide that 30 years into 500, you know, three into 50, what do you get? So around 16 or so. So, so uh, Shem lived for 16 generations, one after the other, uh, 16 of these 30-year intervals, and that opens the possibility and the likelihood of multiple careers. I think one one uh, uh, corrupted Gentile tradition that arises out of this multiple career is the avatar principle, the reincarnation of the Hindus, and to some extent the East Indians. That is, they had this multiple career phenomenon, and they mythologized it into the idea of multiple lives, because it was something like multiple lives, but it wasn't literally multiple lives. So there was an Oberglauber superstition attached to these multiple careers, deducing reincarnation and the avatar principle, the idea that Vishnu comes back as this figure and this figure and this figure. Well. To me, Vishnu is a euhemeristic name for one of the Genesis 10 patriarchs, Yoktan. And he uh, has, like all the other patriarchs, these multiple careers. And therefore, the various avatars of Vishnu are an analysis of the multiple career of that particular Genesis 10 patriarch. Multiple identities. Seventh, euhemerism. Adopt the euhemerist view of pagan gods as members of the universal family. One reason for that presupposition is tradition. That is, I'm impressed with, I was impacted on by writers who had the euhemerist concept in the Christian era. There was a school of euhemerists, beginning with the French Huguenot Samuel Beauchart in the 16th century, and there was another, there was a French Catholic Antoine Bonnier, who was a euhemerist. The best known of them probably is Jacob Bryan, his new system of 1774, but it continued down to Alexander Hissel. To new, uh, I can only say for myself that having adopted Euhemerism hypothetically and tested it in various cases, I've simply found that in many cases it is, it is fruitful, it works. That is, that the, what is said about the high Olympian pantheon, for example, of the Greeks applies to the political history, especially the personal, genealogical, marital history, whatever, of uh, certain members of the Noahic family. I will say this, that euhemerism is not the complete picture of uh, either pagan idolatry or the early post-Diluvian version of religion, right or wrong. Uh, there's more to it, and I've already named the more to it, and that is that the multiple names of God in the Old Testament testify to a theocratic system of some sort that was known to the ancestors of the Gentiles. It was known to Noah's family, and it, it emerges in the Sumerian high pantheon. So that when I deal with the names in the high pantheon of the Sumerians, I'm really looking at two things. You pick a figure such as Utu uh, or uh, another figure such as Nana, the moon god. Well, Nana has a euhemeristic identi identification as far as I'm concerned. Arphaxid one son of Shem, born two years after the flood. I believe that Arphaxid, for certain reasons, became the universal lunar deity and that the Yerik of the Western Semites is a version of him. There's a lunar... Uh, deity among the Egyptians who refers to somebody else, but there are a number of other pantheons where our Foxit is the figure who appears euhemeristically as a, as a moon god, the moon god, and he is the moon god of the Sumerians, Nana, and Sin of the Akkadians. Now, however, at the same time there's a euhemeristic dimension to that name Nana and the lunar principle. The principle itself represents high theology even from our Christian standpoint, and that the lunar principle is in fact the worship of God as El Shaddai. And the type of relationship that you see between God and Abraham is incorporated into that lunar principle. So how do you reconcile the two? The euhemeristic idea that Nana is our Foxed One, a man, interpreted as a god, and on the other hand, 
that the lunar principle conveyed by the name Nana really refers to the El Shaddai hood of God. Well, you reconcile it simply through the concept of, of priesthood. That is, Melchizedek was a priest of El Elyon. Uh, Shem is associated personally with Yahweh Elohim. So it's a priesthood. So the priest becomes the representative of God. And as such, you give rise to the humoristic idea of men uh, reckon gods. Now, by the way, the humorous mystery I don't see as synonymous with idolatry. I don't even see it as evil. Idolatry is obviously wicked, very evil, demonic in character. But the recognition of men as gods is something that actually in principle is sanctioned by the Old Testament, Psalm 82, where God addresses the uh, the El Elyon God, addresses the Elohim men. Some say that they're angels. I don't see how you can consider them angels because they're being rebuked for bad government. And angels are either unfallen or fallen, one of the two. And so the rebuke that is in Psalm 82 would indicate that these are clearly men who are being called Elohim, little gods. And again, there's a passage in Exodus where Moses is said to be a god before Pharaoh and Aaron will be his prophet. So the idea of human deity of a nominal kind is definitely precedented in the Old Testament. And that would explain why you have these priesthood figures, our Fox at One, for example, passed off as the moon god because he's simply the definitive lunar priest, the primary lunar priest of the lunar cultus that then descends in the city of Ur in Sumer down to such figures as Naram Sin, who I believe to be Nahor, the great, the, not the great grandfather, but the grandfather of Abraham. So the lunar principle and the priesthoods behind the Euhemerus mystery. So I don't see Euhemerism and the recognition of these men as, as, as gods. I'm sure that this contributed, this was a a premise that was incorporated into idolatry, but it's not to be confused with idolatry, and polytheism is not nearly as heinous in itself as idolatry is. There's a distinction that should be drawn. The next point eight, critical stance. Critical stance toward the sources I'm using and toward the mind of the Gentiles. In many ways, I praise their, their glory. I'm acknowledging a glory, but on the other hand, it's very obvious that there's a sin there and there's some wickedness in high places, and so we have to adopt a critical position. What is it? To read point number eight, take note of the mendacious tact, that is the lying silence of the Epic of Gilgamesh in denying to its Noah figure, and that would be in the Sumerian Ziasudra, and then he's known as, uh, in the Akkadian or the Semitic languages, as Utanapishtim, I think. The Noah figure, the denial in, these, in this Epic of Gilgamesh, the denial to the Noah figure of any role in the creation of nations and identify a malign process of tactful delusion in suppressing the explicit record of any universal family except in such covert forms as the opening 77 lines of the Marduk Epic. The opening 77 lines of the Marduk Epic are one of the most revealing of all texts or sources for me from the horse's mouth, that is from the early post diluvian world from ancient Mesopotamia. I believe that that part of mythological literature, epic mythological literature, the Marduk epic in the first 77 lines, confesses not only the existence of the universal family, but even confesses the sin of Ham and the action taken against Noah in robbing him of his theocratic authority. That robbing Noah of his theocratic authority is the result of the sin of Ham in Genesis 9, uh, which was the retaliation of the Hamite faction against Noah for cursing Ham's son, Canaan. That is the that's the premise behind this mendacious tact I'm talking about. The reason why the author of the, of the Epic of Gilgamesh can completely ignore the origin of nations theme is that Noah, the figure who survived the flood, had been demoted. And this event occurred at the time of the sin of Ham, just 90 years after the flood, and that's 60 years before the Tower of Babel. So Noah had become, in the minds of some, a theocratic or political non-entity, and through that political logic, the author of the Epic of Gilgamesh permitted himself the luxury of suppressing origins, suppressing the universal family, suppressing the very role of this Noah figure who survived the flood in generating any kind of nations. So the great victory of the Hebrew text, that is the book of Genesis, is that it links the story of the flood to the table of the nations. And yet even today we have people who would throw a wedge between the universal family of Noah and the table of nations and say that it's just an induction of tribes known to Moses because that Gentile instinct to somehow suppress the early post-Diluvian reality, the fact that all nations come from this universal family is very, very great 
there's a tremendous lying silence. It almost operates like the great lie, the apocalyptic lie of the Antichrist, the end of the age. Whatever that lie is, it may be a combination of evolution, something else. But what I see in the early post-Diluvian heritage, in the sin component that's in it, is a tremendous will to suppress this link between this flood story on the one hand and the very nations. The nations are treated as a given, as though they just exist. And all kinds of Darwinism, all kinds of evolution is ready.